Good morning, everyone. It's so great to have you with us again this week. If you remember from our session last week, we learned about the fruit of the Spirit, kindness. And I'm sure you had many opportunities this week to share your kindness with others. I have a question for you. Are you happy? Are you happy? What makes you happy? Would it be possibly a puppy? A brand new bicycle? You just got your final report card and you have good grades? You found out you were going on a vacation with your family? Or you're going to have a picnic with your family, a birthday party, or play with your friends? Or you just found out you made the swim team? If you do not have those things, are you still happy? Are you happy? What makes you sad? Think about that. I have another question for you. Do you have joy? Well, you're probably saying, I thought of the things that make me happy, so of course I have joy. Why would you ask me that question? Of course I have joy, I'm happy. So uh, that means I have joy, right? I have a book that I purchased from our library, or went in and found in our library. It's called Lamb is Joyful. It's a short book, but it's a sweet book. Listen carefully. Little lamb, please share today what the Bible has to say. Joy, a gift from God above. With it, I feel peace and love. Joy comes from the inside out. God loves me, I want to shout. When my bubbles reach the sky, I feel joy as they float by. If I get a funny card, joy comes when I laugh really hard. Sad times come and sad times go. This is something that I know. Soon the sadness goes away and the joy is here to stay. Show your joy because it's true. You can smile for God loves you. Always be joyful. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 Now there is a difference between happiness and joy. And I know that sounds confusing, but there is. Happiness are the things that we just talked about. You having a bicycle, the puppy, going on vacation. Joy comes from within you. And you say, well, how do I get that? Where does it come from? Because God loves you. He gave you Jesus, his son. And Jesus told us so, that he gave us joy. Before he left this earth and went to heaven, he told his disciples, I'm leaving you, but I leave with you my joy. It's one of the fruits of the spirits that we've been talking about, joy. Joy comes within. It can never go away like the things that make you happy. Joy makes you feel good, it's peaceful, it's love, and it's all from Jesus. You can have that joy if you love God, know God, and know that Jesus is your savior, and he died for your sins. He's in your heart to stay, in our body to stay. That joy is always there. It doesn't matter if we lose all the happiness, we can still have the joy. Does Jesus want us to be happy? Of course he does. That's why he gives us the joy. Jesus gives us the joy. Let me read. I'm going to hop, skip, and jump. In John, chapter 15, 9 through 11. As the Father has loved me, Jesus is talking to the disciples now. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain, which means stay. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain, stay, in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's command and remain in his love. Listen up, this is where it's coming. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. That's why we have joy and how we get joy. Jesus gave it to us. He told the disciples he was giving them the joy as well. We have the joy in here. Do you remember the story of Paul and Silas? Do you remember they were imprisoned because they were teaching others about Jesus? And do you remember what happened? They sang all night long. The jailer locked them in prison with a bunch of other prisoners, but they sang all night long. The prisoners listened as well. Prison, the jailer fell asleep, and when he woke up, there was this terrible earthquake. And what happened? If you remember, the gates of the jail, all the chains broke free, all the prisoners were free. But they didn't run, and the jailer was so surprised. He was sure he was going to get in trouble because he thought he should be guarding the prisoners instead of sleeping. But when he got to see Paul and Silas, he saw they had joy. They were singing while they were in prison. He wanted to know more about joy and what it was. Paul and Silas explained what joy is. The jailer wanted to know what joy is and wanted that joy. The jailer became to, came to know Jesus, and now he has joy in his heart, just as you can have joy in your heart. We're going to pretend today, as we like to do that very often. This is joy. This is your joy. This is you. Let's pretend this box is you. This is your joy. The Bible just told us that the joy Jesus put in your heart is inside of you. Your joy is inside. It will stay there. Because you love God, you know God, and you love Jesus. He put that joy in our hearts. Even if we're sad, we can have joy. But Jesus also wants us to share the joy. We can share the joy with others. Show your joy. Tell people about your joy. They need to know that joy that you have is because you love God. You know Jesus. You love Jesus. And he left his spirit within you when he left this earth and went to heaven. Do you have joy? I like to look at joy as, hold your hands like this, and let's pretend this is happiness. Put your hands like this. This is happiness. I think of joy as this. This is happiness. Spread your arms out wide. This is joy. What does that remind you of? Does it remind you of Jesus on the cross? Yes, it does. And that's why you have joy. Jesus left his spirit with us after he died and went to heaven. We're so thankful for that joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and we thank you for the joy from his Holy Spirit within us, the spirit of joy. We know we have the spirit of joy. We know that because he loves us, and we love him, and we know, God, that you loved your son. We ask you to help us to spread the joy, Lord, this week with those we meet so they can see Jesus in us through our joy. Amen. Everybody, stick around. Uh, Sophie has a great song for us today, and I hope you join us next week. Thank you. Yeah. Let, join us now to sing Joy, Joy, Joy. Come on, boys and girls, let's sing along.
now that we sang Waymaker and introduced that last week, join us and sing it again this week. Good morning. Welcome to the Mount Joy Church of God. I'm happy to be with you this morning again to bring you God's word. Let's start by going to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much for the blessings that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for family. We thank you for friends. We thank you, Lord, for neighbors. We thank you, Lord, for even those challenging people that you put in our lives. Uh, all life all human life is made in your image. And so we thank you for all of those little bits of your image that surround us. Lord, teach us to love more. Be with us now as we study your word, open your word to our hearts and our minds that we can know more of you and the relationship that you want to have with us. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So knowing that I'd have a few weeks off from preaching, and I do want to thank Keith and Justin so much uh, for filling the pulpit for me these last two weeks. Um, they did such a wonderful job, and uh, I know everyone appreciates hearing different voices, so that's, that's a great thing to have people, even in our own congregation, that can speak the word of God. But knowing that I was going to have some time off, I made myself a mental to-do list. Uh, some things I'd like to get done around the house, uh, some books that I've just put off reading, uh, maybe connecting with some of the people that I'd really like to give a phone call with and reconnect. And I'd like to tell you that I've accomplished everything on my list. But I can't tell you that because I didn't do anything. I've got nothing done, absolutely nothing. My, my to-do list was just sitting there doing absolutely nothing. I give myself a little grace uh, because I was recuperating from surgery. But uh, the truth is that at, by the time I'd get myself up out of bed every morning and get washed and dressed and make myself a cup of coffee, I was just ready for a nap. And the rest of the week or rest of the day would go downhill from there. But like I said, going to give myself some grace. Maybe you found that to be true in your life as well. Maybe you've looked back on this time of stay-at-home orders and wonder, what on earth have I gotten done? So many good plans that you've had maybe haven't gotten done. And, and you look at your neighbors and, and you think, wow, look at all the stuff that they're doing. They're so creative and, and they've remodeled their whole entire house and their children are doing all these really cool creative things. And, you know, we're just struggling to hang on here. And maybe you're a little disappointed. All the pressures of the day, the interruptions, the, the emergency situations, the needs and wants of those people in your life have just taken that time away from you. And... You would hope to get these things done, but your to-do list hasn't really been finished. Sometimes you just need to hit the reset button to help you get back on track. Today we're going to look at a man who God called to serve as a prophet. He was given a wake-up call to the Jewish exiles that came back from captivity in Babylon. His mission was to put the people back on track in rebuilding the temple. They had started to build the altar and the foundation, but they never completed their work. The book of Haggai is part of the minor prophets. There are 12 minor prophets, and they're called minor not because their message isn't important, but because they're shorter than the other three major prophets. And most of us don't spend a whole lot of time studying the minor prophets. Uh, I like Haggai, because he has a lot to say for us. And one reason that a lot of preachers like Haggai is because when he prophesied, the people actually listened and obeyed and did what they were supposed to do. I think we can identify with his message. He told the people, finish what you started, and God will be with you. Through the physical act of rebuilding the temple, the people began a shift in their spiritual lives from devotion of themselves to de devotion of God. But before we get too far into Haggai's story, I want to give you a little bit of background. The people of the nation of Judah, the southern tribe, they were defeated by the Babylonians and were deported in waves. The first group of captives included Daniel. You remember Daniel's story. Uh, that's the time period we're talking about. Many years later, the Babylonian kingdom was overcome and conquered by the Persians. And so there was a new king, King Cyrus. And a year after he took office, he came across this um, thought of these Jewish people and their plight. And he made a decree to return all of the Jewish people back to Israel. And so he sent Ezra with Tons of gold and silver and slaves and, and animals, everything that would be needed to rebuild that temple. All of those treasures that were taken out of the house of God, the bowls and the plates and, the, and all the gold uh, lampstands and all of those things, he sent back with Ezra. What a way to travel with all those millions and millions of dollars. But he made it back and the Jewish people began to rebuild the ruined temple, starting with the altar. And they laid the foundations, but then there were problems. Problems came. The world crashed in. Neighbors in the area, fearing political and 
and economic and religious implications of a Jewish state. They, they feared that. So they sent a message to the king, Cyrus, saying, you know, you really need to stop this rebuilding the temple because these Jewish people, I mean, look, look at the history of Jerusalem. It's a rebellious city. They don't listen. They're not going to pay their taxes. So you need to stop them from rebuilding this temple. And so King Cyrus sent for the documents, and he found all of the history of Jerusalem and found indeed that was true. Now, yes, it was, but that didn't mean that these people were rebellious. It was just these neighboring nations that were set against rebuilding. And so this work stopped, and many years passed. Eventually, another man became king, King Darius. And so in that time, when a new king took place, the old orders were nullified. And so they didn't have to follow the authority over them anymore in stopping the rebuild. They could continue to rebuild if they wanted to at this point. But for whatever reason, they decided not to. Out of fear, maybe, of neighboring countries, that they would stop them again. Maybe they stopped building just because of lack of motivation. I mean, it's hard enough to get a building project started. Once it's stopped, it's even harder to get it restarted. And that's where Haggai steps in. He spoke the word of God. That's the, the business of a prophet, to speak the word of God. His job was not to carry the stones or the timbers or construct the house of God, this temple. His job was to tell the people what God was saying. His job was to motivate the people to get the job finished. One example of a good leader is someone who will listen to God, obey his will, speak God's words, and motivate others to do the same. I like Haggai because he took a group of very unmotivated people and led them in rebuilding the temple. So I'm wondering, how did he do it? I mean, how did he get them to finish this job? Let's take a little closer look. Haggai's first address to the people is found in Haggai chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. And I'll read that for you. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time, though, for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. So Haggai, we find, tells it like it is. These people are making excuses. They're not saying no. They're not going to rebuild the temple. They're just saying not yet. The house of God is in ruins, but the people have been making upgrades to their own homes. Now remember, Ezra had brought back more than enough money to do the work. It wasn't like there was a contractor waiting to get paid. Ezra was given all of those golden dishes and bowls and tools and everything he needed to build the temple. And they even took another collection to help with the cost. So that was not an excuse. They had the means to rebuild. And this new king had not given them orders to stop. This is a unique phenomenon today. Have you found or heard that people just don't want to go back to work? They've grown accustomed to working from home or not working at all. And they find it more appealing to just simply refuse to go back to the office or to the job site. Now, I'm assuming that at some point, these unemployment wages are going to stop and they're going to have to make some harder decisions. But I just find it odd that people don't want to go back. In the church, the opposite is true. There are so many people so eager to get back to coming into worship again, to meet together. But there are others who are fearful of returning to corporate worship. And as we start to talk about the regathering, if you find yourself wanting to come, that desire to meet and to have community feeling and worship again, that's great. Do that. Do it with care and respect for those who may still be fearful. 
give careful thought about judgmental attitudes because we don't want division. We don't want to be like those who demean folks for uh, being careful. Um, maybe they, they want to wait. We don't know what their life is like. We don't know if there are vulnerable people in their household or underlying medical conditions that would put people at risk. We just don't know what goes into making that decision to come back to worship or not. You don't know why they make these decisions. Give careful thought when as you return to love everyone, no matter if they come back in a few weeks or a few months. We're just glad to have people that want to rejoice together. So back in Jerusalem, the people are working hard, uh, but they're not getting the full return on their labors. Uh, the paychecks are not lasting throughout the week. And I find that when we choose to withhold something from God, uh, we find that our work is not fulfilling. Either people complain about, you know, they go to work and, and they don't like the people they work with, or maybe even if they do like the people they work with and they don't like the compensation they get and they complain about their money or they complain about work all the time. Things just aren't right. They don't fit in. There's just that feeling of, of discontent. And I think that's what it was like for those people in Jerusalem. So God tells these people in verse 8, he tells them, go up to the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Go up to the mountains and get timber. Get to work, is what he tells them. We have to be really careful here with this verse because just from a quick read of it, taking it out of context, it seems that God is telling us all that we need to be lumberjacks and construction workers. Or, if we continue to take this out of context, text, it might seem that God wants us to make a building for him so that he'll be happy. I think what God is really trying to say is that he wants his people to make an effort. Since this relationship is now forming with these new, this new group of people, these were the children of those that were taken into captivity, and a new relationship with their God was forming. He wanted them to know that it wasn't just all about the work. He wanted them to know that he was worth working for, but he was also worth taking time to be with. In a time when God did not dwell in the hearts of the people, he wanted his presence to be close to them. And it was only possible to do that with a physical place, to have a temple. If you needed forgiveness from sin, you went to the temple. If you needed healing, you went to the temple. It was the way God showed his love for his people. And with no temple, it was like the people were saying, well, we'd like to have a relationship with God at some point, but right now I'd rather build up my own house and make my family more comfortable. Verse 9 says it pretty clear. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. You know, when you listen to it, Haggai's message was a little harsh, but it obviously needed to be. He spoke for God, words of rebuke and warning. His message was designed to arouse the people from spiritual, religious apathy and indifference so that they would see and really understand the implications of the temple left unfinished. But I love what happens next. Uh, many times we hear of these strong messages of warnings from prophets, and apparently no one listens. In fact, they were told by God that no one was going to listen. Or maybe people just listen and give lip service and say, sure, we're going to follow that, but then they don't follow up on the promises that they make. But the people here, they obeyed. And I just want to applaud them. I mean, finally, the, the team I'm cheering for gets to score. They score big. They get it. They understand the need to go back and do the work on the temple. Now, you might wonder, you know, why a temple is such a big deal. And we've already talked about it being this meeting place where God can dwell with his people. But it's also a place to show off God's greatness. Every city in that time had temples. Some had 
many temples, and each temple had their own god. And the bigger and the more costly the building, the more powerful the god was thought to be. By not caring enough about their god to even finish this modest temple, it was, it was humiliating. God is worthy of honor. Today, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Our bodies are a temple. Did you ever think about how you care for your body? I'm not suggesting we worship our body. Um, that's swinging too far in the opposite direction. But sometimes we don't care enough about our own bodies. We are a dwelling place of God, so we should try to take good care of it. So the people in Jerusalem obey, and they start rebuilding again. And at this point, Haggai has another message for them. This time he's asking for the people who remembered about the old temple. Remember its former glory, he asked. It was a massive structure. King Solomon had spent billions, for you math people, you can go back and see how many shekels and, and everything. But I'm telling you, it was massive structure. It was the wonder of the world. It was huge. It was all covered in gold. It was just an incredible thing. It was a source of national identity. And the temple that they were now building was nothing so grand. In the book of Ezra, it's recorded that some of the older men wept because they remembered they had seen the old temple. And I can imagine some of those older men talking to the younger men, telling him about the good old days, you know, about the awesome worship that they had there at that temple. Now, I'm sure they were glad to be helping to rebuild this temple to their God. But this one, compared to the way it was when they were younger, well, this temple was meh. And so Haggai, his message was to encourage them. He spoke of God's blessings. He asked them to remember the scarcity of food during the time when they were disobedient and the abundance of food and the blessings that God was pouring out of them. Even with this smaller temple, God told them in chapter 2, verse 9, that the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Well, how can that be, you wonder? How can, can this smallish, modest temple, how can the glory be more than King Solomon's temple that was just the wonder of the world? Well, that answer wasn't given to them until maybe 400 or 500 years later because Jesus was there. Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to be dedicated at this temple. When he was a young boy, Jesus was at this temple as he talked with the elders and the teachers of the law, leaving his parents to wonder where he was. It was this temple where Jesus taught as an adult, where he healed people, where he threw over the money changers' tables. This is that temple. This is the temple that he prophesied the destruction Greater things are yet to come. Greater things will be done there. God told this to Haggai. And this message about letting the people know, it, it allowed them to know that no outward religious observance, no building can communicate holiness or gain acceptance with God or restore his favor. And that's a message we need to hear today. No outward religious services or building will gain God's favor if our hearts are not right. We do need to work on the Lord's house, not a building. And I hope we've learned that over this time of this pandemic, that the church is you. You are the church. And as a part of the church, each one of you has been given this task of rebuilding and continuing to build up God's house. It was not the job of Haggai to go get lumber or set the beams in place. It was the work of the people. And just as today, the job of reaching out to people who, who need to hear the good news, that God loves them and wants to have a relationship with them, that work is to be done by you, the people, the members of the church. And when I say members of the church, that's everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, whether you're a member of Mount Joy Church 
or we're another church or not a member anywhere, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a member of the church. And we need to be working together. God promised his favor and his aid. In chapter 2 of Haggai, we see him promise to shake the nations. He is sovereign. He can do that. He sees the work that the people are doing, and he sees their humble and obedient hearts. And so he strengthens that relationship with them, and he tells them, I am going to be with you. That name, I am, would be a reminder of his saving grace when they were brought out of Egypt. What an awesome statement when he says, my spirit remains with you, do not fear. There are many things that the people of Jerusalem were afraid of. They had violent neighbors. They had drought, famine, ridicule. But God assured this struggling community of their preservation, even in the midst of powerful enemies. We too are given reminders that our God is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. God pursues people. He wants to show them the extent of his love. As we build a relationship with our God, this might be the time to hit that reset button, to get our attitudes and our actions back on track. He calls us to build his house, his church, and we do that by following his example to work and to love. How will you react to hearing this message? What difference will it make in your life? Will you ignore it and go about your own business or maybe agree with these ideas but never really intend on doing any of the work? Or will you, like the people in Haggai's time, listen and obey, follow the will of God, and build his house? We build God's house by caring for others, by loving people in visible ways. We build God's house when we care for the sick or the hungry or for those who need help with child care or elder care or house repair. We build God's house by upholding the innocent and demand justice for people who discriminate against them. We build God's house when we get involved in social justice and providing rehab for drug and alcohol users to support unwed mothers and other community development projects. There are so many ways to build God's house where has God given you the skills or the passion to serve? And are there others around you who feel the same? Go get to work. What are you waiting for? There's no one telling you you're not allowed to. There's no king saying you must stop your work. Follow the authority put over you as much as you can. But you were called to a higher authority to obey God's voice. Go get to work. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. This is the season to build God's house. Amen. So now join us and sing Build Your Kingdom Here. <laughs> 